All right, so of course today is Bible Sunday, and uh, the, the title of my sermon this morning is called The Perfectly Preserved Word of God. Now, we were out soul winning yesterday, and uh, Brother Robert and I, we talked to this young girl, or young, young lady, I want to say, she's not just a, you know, she wasn't a, a child, but a young lady, and kind of, it's interesting because she was going to one of the mega churches up here, and, but she said that she's pretty much a Buddhist, that she follows that way of thinking. It, to me, it's just kind of funny how you can just be a Buddhist and just be okay going to a Christian church and stuff. I mean, it's like the, the, the compatibility in her mind was just not a problem at all. But um, I, it's because she's going to a place that doesn't teach any doctrine. But uh, there's a lot of things she doesn't understand. She's a nice girl, okay? And we, we spent quite a bit of time, you know, giving her the gospel, not rejecting or anything like that. She was really open, so we were able to give her a lot of information. But she was at a point where she had a lot of, a lot of false premises and misunderstandings of Christianity and, a, and kind of a lot of things that need to be worked through. Now, the reason why I bring her up is that where she is in her understanding, I mean, there's a lot of things that need to be worked out. The sermon like this, isn't going to convince someone like that that the King James Bible is true. Right. Okay? So what I'm preaching this morning is supposed to be for people who are already believers, people who already believe in Christ, people who are already saved, to understand the difference. I'm never going to be able to convince to a non-believer that the King James Bible is the Word of God. It's just not going to happen. You have to accept it on faith and and. What's funny is that people will take this and be like, oh, you're supposed to be doing this, this Bible study and everything else, and you want to convince people that you've got the Word of God, and you're using circular logic. Well, yes, I am. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be just up front and admit that right from me. The way that I'm going to prove the King James Bible is mostly going to come from the Bible itself. It's going to come from the source text. Okay? But like I said, I'm speaking to people who already believe that God is real, that already believe that God created the earth, that already believe that God made a law, that God created, uh, you know, thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do that, and, and that we're all sinners, and that Jesus Christ came as our Savior, and that we put our faith on Him to save us from our sins. Amen. We all believe that here already. Now, the big question for you believers is why do you believe what you believe about God? And again, you'll get a lot of answers from different people. If you ask a Catholic, you might say, well, because the church told me, right? And, and plenty of people, it's not even just the Catholic church, but plenty of people will say, well, that's just what so-and-so said, and that's what I believe because someone else told me. I don't think that that's a way that we ought to live our lives. It's, it's very easy to be deceived when all you're doing is just listening to a person, just listening to a man. Man is fallible. Man's not perfect. How do you know for sure whether or not what you're hearing is true and what we have in this church is a foundation of our beliefs being built on God's words. And the point I was trying to illustrate to this girl yesterday that we were speaking with is ultimately, you know, like, like why do you believe what you believe? What, what is it that, that makes your belief better than someone else's or, or yours is right and someone else's is wrong? Because... If it's just your thoughts or someone else's thoughts or someone else's opinions, who are you to decide mine are better than yours or yours are better than, you know, it's all arbitrary. But if you have a foundation, if you could say, we all have our own opinions and differences, but this is God's word. This is something that God gave to us, that God breathed, that God actually spake audibly and men heard it and wrote it down and said this is what God said well if that's true which again I'm speaking to believers we have an authority we have a foundation we have something that we could rely on so what we ought to be doing is saying I'm going to get everything that I believe from God's word from what God said and not just from what man believes or what man teaches it's going to be from God Straight from the Word of God. Well, if that's your belief, amen, I think you're right. You're on the right path. That's the way I believe. But then you got to ask yourself, well, where is the Word of God? Where is it? That's what I, amen. That's, 
It's in the King James Bible. We've got it here in English. And again, I'm not going to be speaking to other languages, okay? That's outside of the scope of this sermon. We all speak English in this room today, so we're talking about the English language. I believe that God's Word is not bound. I believe that God's Word crosses all languages and is capable of being translated into any known human language Amen. without any problems. I, I, I don't think there's an issue at all. We're going to get to that a little bit later. There's a lot of different aspects that I'm going to touch on today. This is an issue, I was going to start by saying, this is an issue that if you're already not settled, I think everybody here is, but I'm not, I'm not positive. If, if you're not completely settled on this, there is mountains of evidence to, to support why we as a church believe in the King James Bible, that we believe that this is the true Word of God. I'm going to present some of that evidence to you. I'm going to be doing more of a summary because there's so many different topics to cover. I'm not really going to be going in-depth in any individual one. But if you're interested in any of the topics, you know, I'm not really going to be answering very many critic, critics, you know, critical questions on what people who will be anti-KJV only um, if you're interested in any of that stuff, let me know. There's, I could give you plenty of great resources to, to, to research further for yourself on this topic. This is something that since I've been saved, I've been learning more about, and I just love it because it's, the Bible has proven itself true to me over and over and over and over again. And one of the reasons why I'm preaching this sermon is that I want you to get your faith rattled or shaken by someone who's going to try to tell you that, hey, there's errors in that Bible. Hey, that's not really the Word of God. Because the thing about it, if there's, if there's mistakes, if there's errors, if there's just things that are just completely wrong, then how could it come from God? And that's a logical way to think. I mean, it's something that would make sense to say, well, wait a minute. And, and I believe that. If there's just problems and like it says one thing over here and then it says something different over here and they just completely contradict each other, that didn't come from God. God's not going to make some stupid mistakes like that. Now, if it was just a collection of man's writings, I would expect that to happen. I would not expect, ever, especially the way that the Bible is, is, was collated and formed over these different time periods, even in different geographic regions, you know, of God's word being, being given. I would expect there to be more, like some error. Just if it was strictly just human beings doing the work, that's what I would expect. But since this is the word of God, it, it's it's not found, and people will make claims that oh no, this is an error, that's an error. I've looked at every single claim that I've looked into. I've looked into quite a few because at first it bothered me a little bit, but after years and years and years of looking at this and studying, I just realized. And just, and just know, I mean, having the faith in God's word anyways, it's just, it's, it's, it's people that don't want to believe, that don't have their faith in God, that don't have their faith in God's word, that are trying to make you not have your faith also. But there are plenty of good um, examples and, and good explanations for the so-called contradictions. But again, I'm not going to get into all that this morning either because I just want to teach to you kind of how we got the Bible, and um, a lot of scripture that supports that there is a word of God and a word of God that we can trust and that's not corrupted and that God has preserved for us today. Now, when we're looking to form our opinions or our, our beliefs, our doctrines based on a book, we need to make sure we got the right one, right? We say this is, we got plenty of books out there that'll say Holy Bible. Like this one says Holy Bible on the cover. There's a lot. You go to a Christian bookstore, you go to Barnes and Nobles, whatever, you'll find a lot of books that say this. But there's a lot of false advertising out there too. There's a lot of books that say this that aren't really the Holy Bible. And it's interesting. I don't understand how you can all put the Holy Bible on here, yet when you open up the pages and start reading and comparing them, they don't say the same thing. How can you have the same title when they don't, when they don't say the same thing? In... Um, I, I looked this up because I wanted to get a, try to get an accurate number of how many English translations there are of the Bible, English versions of the, of the Bible. And in 2000, I found an article from 2009. Right? So we're in 2016. This is seven years ago. I found this article on AmericanBible.org that stated, the number of printed English translations and paraphrases of the Bible, whether complete or not, is about 900. 900. 
So you look at that, and now when you go to a Christian bookstore, you're not going to see 900, but you're going to see a lot. Yeah. You're going to see dozens, probably, of, of Bibles that are, that are all different. They're going to be like, well, there's this version, and 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 down there in that corner is that old Bible. This is confusing, especially to someone who's a new believer. Maybe someone just, they just put their faith in Christ. They're a babe in Christ. They don't know any better. I mean, they're, I mean, they're happy. They got saved, right? Praise God. Now they want to go out and get a Bible. They're not, they haven't studied all this stuff. They don't, you know, they haven't even thought about it. But your normal person isn't going to think that there's just all tons of different Bibles. They think the Bible is the Bible is the Bible. Right? Most people don't even have any concept of that. They just say, well, you're reading out of the Bible. What do you mean it's different from this one? I thought it's the Bible. Because that's what a normal person would think. But a deceiver wants you to think that way. The confusion comes when there's, well, how am I supposed to know what's the Word of God? And right off the bat, a new believer can just get uh, starting to doubt Doubt their faith. Doubt, doubt anything. Doubt the word of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So God is not the one behind the 900 different versions in English. Amen. That is confusing. And, and I'm sorry, like, I'm making that statement, but I don't think I have to prove that. To say that there's over 900 different versions, that is confusion. There is no, no clarity there as to what is God's word, what is the truth. We know that God is not the author of confusion, so those verses can't all be from God. There's some people out there that will claim that, oh, well, they're all God's word. It's all from God. It's confusing. When they say different things, it's confusing. They are not all of God. But we know who would be interested in confusing people about what God says. In Genesis 3, I'm just going to read this for you. You don't have to turn there. Verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The very first thing that Satan does in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve that, that we have recorded here, that we see he approaches this woman and says, Did God really say that? Because what did God say? You could eat of all the trees, right? Except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, and, and I'm paraphrasing that. But that was what God was, was explaining to them, and that's the rules that God made. And he says, well, did God say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And you see how it kind of twists the words around? Because he said, no, you can eat of all the gardens, uh, all the trees except for this one. And he says, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Well, that's not, you know, he's already mixing it up and he's questioning it. So, well, did God say that? Did he really say that? And when you have all these different versions and you start saying, well, wait a minute, this one says this and this one says this, you're going to start questioning, well, did God really say that? I mean, this one says that. Did, did he say that? I don't know. Did he say this? It's an attack of Satan. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And what's interesting here is that the woman gets everything right, but then she says, Neither shall ye touch it, which that's not what God commanded either. But he's already shaking her up, and, and she's like, Well, wait, we're not going to eat of it, or not even touch it. Lest you die. And verse 4 says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So now he's just coming right out and just saying, contradicting God's word. Well, you're not really going to die. It's not for sure. It's not a certainty that you're going to die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Which is stupid because just as somehow gaining knowledge means you're not going to die. <laughs> Right? <laughs> but that's what he's saying to her. And then, of course, he deceives her. He tricks her. And she, she falls for it. She looks at the tree now and, and starts to covet it and grabs it and eats it. But um, that's the tactic from the beginning that Satan has used on God's word. Right. And we ought not to be ignorant of his devices. We can see way back when, I mean, the very first thing that we see Satan doing 
is deceiving people and questioning God's word and, and changing God's word and, and doing all this. It's been going on forever, for as long as mankind has been around, as long as Satan's been on this earth and deceiving people. And hopefully I can prove to you today that not only is the King James Version the Bible we should use and fully trust as God's word in English, but that the modern versions are literally of Satan. That they're of the devil, that they're satanic versions. That it's not that, well, they're just not quite as good. It's not that, well, it's okay, but I, I still think this is a good version. I still think this is a good translation. If you want to get the best one, it's KJV. No, these other perversions is what the, exactly that. They're a perversion of the Bible. They're not a version of the Bible. They're a perversion of the Bible. They've been corrupted. They've been twisted. The intent is to cause confusion. The intent is to get you to doubt the Word of God. And they're evil Bibles. Amen. Yes, amen. We don't want to get a, a, a slack stance on this. We need to stand for the truth. We need to stand for what's right. We need to be able to make a claim and say, no, this is God's word. Thus saith the Lord. And if someone says something different, that, you know, I mean, think about it. If you were to be quoted as saying anything, but the person quoting you just kind of threw in their own words or saying, well, this is what you meant. Can you call that a quote? Can you say that this is what, you know, for example, Pastor Burson said? You can't do it. You can't say these are his words and then say, well, you I mean, you basically just meant, you know, don't sin. You know, he preached an entire sermon on fornication or adultery and he's like, well, Pastor Burson said not to sin. It's not what I said. I mean, maybe at one point, right? But, but the, the point is when you're quoting somebody, you need to be accurate with it. Right. You, you need to give all the words. And if you're not doing that, you can't say, for example, over and over and over and over and over again in the Bible, thus saith the Lord. Right? It, like it, going all the way back to the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse number one. And God spake all these words, saying. That's how the, that's how the chapter starts out. Did God speak all of those words or not? If you're making the claim, if you're writing it down, if you're saying God spake these words, it better be true, otherwise it's a lie. It better be exactly what God said or else you're lying. Amen. Now, I'm briefly going to cover this, this copyright issue because we have over 900 versions of the Bible. And in order to do that, in today's, well, you don't, you don't have to. You don't have to copyright a work if you don't want to, right? But the point of copyright is to protect your work so that other people can't reproduce it, basically, and make a profit off of it. Right. I mean, you could say, yeah, I want to retain the integrity of the work so that no one changes it. But... If you believe that what you're doing, I mean, if you're, if you're putting out what you believe is the Word of God, and, I mean, people should be able to identify, yeah, this is right. Why would you even, you know, let people do what they're going to do, but, but you're putting out what you believe is a, is a true work. You, wouldn't, you shouldn't need to have to make it, but the thing is with a copyright is that you own that then, and you get royalties if someone else wants to use it. You, control, you, know, you have complete control, and you make money off of it. And ultimately, when you have a lot of people that are Christian, that believe in God, you've got a big market to sell them a book that their faith relies on. And when you can start coming out with different versions of the Bible and market to people, there's a lot of money to be made there. And I, I'll be honest with you, you know, that's, that is, you know, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. And that is a big motivation for why we have all of these other versions out there for people to get involved with. Now, I tried, I've, I've heard this before and I've heard it repeated. I have not found proof for this. And I, and I did a lot of research last night trying to find the evidence for this and I could not find it. And, and what I've heard is that in order to receive a copyright on a Bible version, that it has to be 4% different than any other work. I still cannot find that if, if it's a fact, that fact. But what I did find 
from the copyright.gov website was a question that says, how much do I have to change in my work, in my own work, to make a new claim of copyright? So if you're doing a revision, if, so if an author creates a book, right, and they want to come out with a new edition, they want to come out with a new version of what, what's already been produced, what's already been created. It's very similar to what we're talking about here because Bibles, right, are basically revisions. They're basically, you know, just, just changes in, in the text of, of what's supposed to be an established text. It says, you may make a new claim in your work if the changes are substantial and creative. Something more than just editorial changes or minor changes. This would qualify as a new derivative work. For instance, simply making spelling corrections throughout a work does not warrant a new registration, but adding an additional chapter would. Those are the words of, from the copyright.gov. So if you want to uh, receive a copyright on a work, on a literary work like the Bible is, it has to have significant changes. So when they tell you, well, all we've done is, you know, we've got rid of the these and the thous. We just want to make it a little bit easier to understand. Not it's not true. Because you wouldn't even be able to copyright it if that's all. If you just change the and thou to you and left everything else the same, you can't copyright that. That's not a, that's not a significant change. Now, I'll say, okay, maybe there's one or two versions you might be able to come up with if they did a lot of word changes and they just said, these are all archaic words and we're just going to replace all of these words so that people can understand it. Maybe you can copyright that and maybe there'd be some legitimacy to that because that's the claim that people are making, but you know what? That book doesn't exist. Right. Not that I've ever seen and it's definitely not the ones that are being promoted as these are just, you know, making it easier to be understood. Right. And we're going to get into the, into the reasoning for that. Why? And the, basically the reasoning for that, and I'll get into that in just a minute, is because the new ver all the modern versions are based off of different source texts. So English is a translation from the, way, from the languages that the, the Bible was originally given to us in, which would be the, the languages spoken by the people at the time. So in the Old Testament, God had given his word unto Moses and unto these other men of God, and they spake Hebrew. And they spake an ancient Hebrew. I mean, they, they spake, you know, their language at that time. That was what was used to communicate with people. Okay, well, that makes sense. There's this group of people, they speak this language, so God gave them his word in the language they understood. New Testament times, you get, you get basically it's Greek. Okay? That's what people commonly spoke. That's what the, the, you know, the apostles knew Greek. Jesus knew Greek. You know, they, they would speak this language. They knew other languages too, but it's evident. We'll get to that in a minute. But the, the Bible was, was, by and large, written, penned down when it was originally written, which we don't have the original autographs. It's believed in the Greek language, and it makes sense that it would be. Okay? So anything that we have today has to be translated, if we're going to understand it in English, it has to be translated from those languages to our language so we can understand it. Makes sense, right? I know, and, I, and I'm sorry for make it, trying to break this down so stupid simple, but it's important. What people will say then is, well, there's things that you could write in Hebrew and there's things that you could write in Greek that don't translate to English. Wrong. It's incorrect. That's, I mean, that's the claim that's made, but... But it's false. Anything that you can say in a language, you can say in another language. Now, what they like to do, though, is play these little semantic games, little word games, right? So let's just say you have a word that doesn't have a one-for-one -one translation. There are just, I mean, there's just not a word that exists that encapsulates the entire meaning of this other word. It doesn't mean you cannot convey the same exact meaning of that word. You just can't use one word to do it. Yeah, just have to use maybe a couple of words, a few words to get that exact same meaning across. And first of all, with this concept, again, and, and the loss in translation, it's, it's, what it's, it's thrown out there just to get you to doubt. There's no evidence of it. There's no proof of it. I have yet to have someone say, well, this is just 
means something else without them being able to tell you what it means? Like, well, if that's what it means, then why wouldn't you make a version that that's what it says? Then you'd have an accurate translation, right? No one is, I've never heard anyone say, well, this word, you can't translate it. I can't even tell you what it means because it's just completely unique to Hebrew. It's completely unique to Greek. We just can't translate it. No one knows what it means. If there was cases like that, then I'd say, well, I guess we have to learn Greek and Hebrew. But there's not words like that. It doesn't exist. We communicate. We need to be able to communicate in languages. You, you, could, you could communicate with anyone of other languages and get the exact same meanings across. Now, do we, need, so do we need to go back to the originals to know for sure what God's Word says? Well, first of all, the originals don't exist. First of all, the Bible says holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's how we received God's Word. Holy men of God spake. Now, they ended up being written down. But you go from first the speaking to the writing. And if you're going to say, well, you know, human beings make a mistake, there could be an error, well, then you could say, well, what if the originals had an error then? Because you have a human being writing down what they heard from God. Right? How could you even trust an original then? I mean, if you're going to take that line of thought, as opposed to what I believe is that God is capable of not only speaking to a man where a man could hear him, but also using that man to write down his words without making a mistake. And not only that, not, it doesn't just stop there. I believe God is actually powerful enough and has done this that he's able to use men to preserve his word throughout time and to convey the same exact words of God in another language. Amen. I believe that God's capable of doing all of those things, and he, not only is he capable, but he has done those things. There is no reason to believe that it stopped at the moment, that, that, his, that his hand in giving us the word of God stopped at the moment that he spake. There's no reason to believe that it stopped at the moment it got written down the first time. There's no evidence to show that any of that has just, it just stopped. And it's God just says, well, I'm done here. Hope you don't screw it up. There's no evidence of that. And we know that God's word is not bound by language. And I think that's the reason why different languages were used even in the, the creation and, or the, the, you know, giving us his word. Because I don't think God wanted us just to all speak one language. I mean, when the people did that, we've got the Tower of Babel as an example of, of what God thought about that. Hey, the people are one. They, they come together in this one city. They've got one language. They've got one government. And they're trying to work their way to heaven. And God confounded their language to separate them into different nations and different peoples, different languages. That was God's plan. That's what God wanted. He's the one who created the different languages in the first place. Right. Don't believe this, this naturalistic nonsense that we evolved from apes and different, you know, people developed their own languages because they were separate from each other and what you know, and they started writing on caves walls with hieroglyphics and they didn't know how to speak and make words and make sentences so they just they didn't know how to write anything and that's just what they did you know and just this evolution garbage god gave us the language adam and eve were able to speak the day they were created they knew whatever language god programmed them with and then when god confounded their language the people who speak different languages knew whatever language they were speaking it, it, miraculously but God had them all programmed with their own languages. So if he's able to do that, and if God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, if God wants everyone to believe, then he's got to be able to communicate to all the different languages with his word. It makes sense. There's no reason we have to, to elevate the Hebrew or the Greek or the Aramaic. Or, I mean, what are you going to do? When you have the New, in the New Testament, you have people like Jesus Christ or the Apostle Paul speaking, speaking when they're speaking in the Hebrew tongue, speaking in another language, yet in the original autograph that everyone wants to go back to, it's written down in Greek. The words that they spake in Hebrew were already instantly translated into Greek in the first edition of the Bible, the first writing of God's Word. Right off the bat, you have a translation. 
Can you trust the Greek? I don't know. Did we lose anything in the translation when Paul spake unto the people in the Hebrew in their own tongue? No. That's ridiculous. I, I think these, I, I literally believe that these examples are in the Bible to show us that there are no problems with a translation, that we can receive God's word through a translation and it's still completely preserved and is contain, does contain all of God's words. Even in Acts chapter 2, you have the day of Pentecost, right? You have thousands of people being saved. What happened? The Bible says they were, filled, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And what were they doing? They were getting people saved. They were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ unto the people who were there out of basically every nation under heaven. There were people there from all over the world that came to Jerusalem at that time God used a miracle where his disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost and can speak in other languages. And it says if the Spirit is giving them utterance, if the Spirit is the one that, that's causing them to speak, and they're preaching the gospel, which is evident because they're getting people saved, do you think that the Spirit is unable to correctly translate? They didn't know the languages. Excuse me, that these other people spake. The Arabians and the Cretes and, you know, and all the, the list of, of, of different types of people who were there. They didn't know those languages. The Spirit did the translating for them and spake the Word of God. I, I don't think the Spirit was, was uh, going, well, I don't know what we're going to do here because we're going to lose something in our translation. It's not bound, God's not bound by that. The Holy Spirit's not bound by that. And see, if the Holy Spirit is involved then there's no problem with the translation. And I believe the Holy Spirit was involved in the translation of the King James Version of the Bible. Now, let's understand the translations because basically when you, when you look at the way that the translations were done for the English language, you basically have two translations. So what it boils down to, two different families of translations. You got the King James Bible on one and every other version on the other end. Right. I mean, like, literally. And people want to throw the New King, King James Version with the King James. It's not. There are, there are more similarities with the New King James and the King James than any of the other ones, but any of the differences, all the changes that are made, all line up with, with this other family. So that's why I lump it over here, because the only thing they're doing is just saying, well, we're just making changes from this group and this way of thinking and this, and this methodology. And everything is different about the translations and, and how they were made, how, where the source texts are from, the, 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 every, everything. Every step of the way is different. So, for example, the KJV is a word-for-word -word translation. It's not thought-for-thought. Thought. Now, I say that hesitantly because any work of a translation, as I was mentioning earlier, you're going to have to do some rewording, a little bit of reorganizing. You know, different languages have verbs and subjects and nouns and things in different places. You have to reorder, you have to reorganize, and there isn't always a one-for-one -one word translation. Sometimes you have words that need to be explained using one or two other words to, to get the same meaning across. So, but, but by and large, it's a word-for-word -word translation. There's a few cases where you could see idioms being used and the men who are expert translators of the Bible and expert in those languages and men that knew 17 languages individually like uh, Lancelot Andrews and you look at some of the other uh, just the academics of the men that were used to translate the Bible and, and what their qualifications were and, and how well they knew these languages that they were doing the translations from understood the language, understood when an idiom was used, understood these things to be able to do these translations. Because, you know, I, I read the arguments and complaints. People say, oh, well, the Bible says God forbid, but that's not exactly what the Bible says in the, in the underlying text, in, the, in, in, the, you know, in what the, the KJV was translated from. It was an idiom used that means the exact same thing. And, and it literally is was the, the, the common day literal translation for what was being said in order to get that exact thought across and that exact meaning across there is and there's a few instances of that
But it's not like, see, the, the, the problem with just a thought-for-thought thought translation of just applying that to everything is you get interpretation involved. Right. You start to just say, well, this really means this, and this, you know, instead of sticking to what the words are and, and, and just trying to leave it at that. But anybody today in our society can recognize an idiom that's used. And an idiom is just a phrase that's just commonly used, um, even though the literal meaning might not be the exact same meaning. So when that's found in scripture, it, it is translated appropriately. And you know, we shouldn't focus on these little details and say, oh, well, it's not word for word because of this one thing. You know, understand what it is. I mean, we, we have to be a, it, it's not this, um, it's not so black and white to the point, you know, when you're doing a translation work to just be 100% of the time, this is exactly the way it is every single time. And we shouldn't focus on the, on the really small minutia and just say, well, see there, it, there's a, you know, you can't say it's word for word, you can't say this or whatever and, and, and try to, to throw off the faith. That's not being uh, honest. It's not being intellectually honest. But um, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 20, the Bible reads, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we were given God's word as Scripture when the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And it's not for a private interpretation. The Bible says that, that God's word is not here for you to just make up for yourself. Well, I think this just means that. Because that's just the way I interpret it. We're supposed to read and accept God's word and preach it without just putting our own spin on it and just interpreting the way that we want to. And a lot of the translations, that's actually what they do from the, from the beginning, is they just start interpreting it. And, you know, you say, oh, but these, you know, the, the, the King James translators, how do you know that their, that their, um, their doctrines didn't, didn't corrupt that their, that their beliefs didn't corrupt the message. Well, what they did was they had two different, basically, factions. You know, the Puritans involved and the, the, the Anglicans. They, I mean, you had this, you know, the Church of England, and you had scholars from both sides, and you had separation of all these various people. There's 54 people, I believe, appointed, and I think 47 actually did the work, because some of the people died and stuff that were appointed to do the work. But they had three different locations. They were in like Cambridge, Westminster, and um, Oxford. And they, you know, they were in all these different areas. They had all this access to the resources, all this access to the manuscripts. And they would do, you know, they'd work on their own pieces and then they would send it around so that everybody had to agree and, and go back and forth on the changes to get the meanings across of what the Bible literally says. And, and, and checks and balances to make sure that they're not getting their own doctrines just pushed in there. And again, that's something you can read and see all the rules for the translators, everything that they had to follow, and all the methodology that was used. It was exhaustive. I mean, this was a, this was a big task that was undertaken and, and, and the seriousness and the sobriety that was, that was associated with this work is unmatched. It's unparalleled with any translation to date. With just how much resources, time, the, the scholarship involved, I mean everything. This was the best of the best as far as humanly speaking is concerned. And on top of that, we've got the Holy Ghost involved. That's my belief. You know, we've got God preserving his word anyways. But, but we have men, you know, putting forth their, their best and God covering um, all of the imperfections of those men. So some modern translations claim a word for word also, but they use a different source to translate from. So there, there's different translations. Some will say we're word for word, and some will say they're thought for thought. Okay? King James Bible is, is, is viewed as a word for word translation. There's a couple other of modern versions that will also say they're word for word. I think the New American Standard claims it, and I don't remember which others. But um, the thought for thought is where they just start just, just putting interpretation in, and, and that's what they do. So I, I mean... Right away, you've got, you've got a poor source of a translation for that. But um, if you're doing a word for word, and you say, okay, well, we've got one of these modern translations word for word, well, what are you doing word for word from? And this is the key, and this is what a lot of people don't understand, is the source text. 
I'm going to read for you because, you know, putting together a lot of this information, it's easier sometimes just to read what someone else has written. I already have this stuff fact-checked, um, but uh, I'm going to read this for you. This is from an article. It's on av1611.org. It says, uh, there exist approximately 5,686 bits and pieces of Greek New Testament manuscripts in various forms dating back to 125 A.D. A manuscript is a handwritten copy. So it's talking about these manuscripts and it's saying, okay, you got a handwritten copy of portions of Scripture. And that's what most of these manuscripts are. When you look at the manuscripts that, they, that, that the, the um, translations are derived from, rarely do you have like a complete book of the Bible. It's basically you've got pieces here, a piece here, and they kind of try to put, collate it all together. Um, this says some manuscripts contain a few verses, some a few chapters, and occasionally a complete New Testament book such as Galatians, where they'll actually find they've discovered an entire book that, that's written in Greek, right? Besides the vast amount of Greek manuscripts, there exists over 19,000 ancient New Testament manuscripts in the Syriac, Latin, Coptic, and Aramaic languages. When you consider the manuscript evidence of other ancient literature, such as Aristotle's nearly or measly five copies, or Caesar's ten copies, etc., the, the evidence for the authenticity of the New Testament is staggering. Without, sta without exaggerating or prejudice, the evidence for the val validity of the New Testament is mind-boggling. Just in what that's talking about is just in, in the, the amount of manuscript evidence there is, these thousands upon thousands and even ten thousands, when you, when you expand that to other languages, not just in the Greek, of evidence, all for this one work, all in the New Testament. Compare that to, and that's what he says, you know, um, Aristotle or Caesar, they have these works where there's only like a few copies found. Just the historical evidence proving the New Testament, I mean, just the, 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 how widespread it was, is mind-boggling, how much there is. Now, the King James translated from what's known as the Textus Receptus. Textus Receptus, Greek, uh, and, and that's just for the New Testament, uh, the, the Greek text, right? You have the Textus Receptus, and that agrees with over 99% of the 5,686 Greek manuscripts. For that reason, the Texas Receptus is also called the majority text. So it's what lines up with the majority of what has been found as a text. Now, the modern versions are actually translated from the work. And see, just so you understand this, the, the bits and fragments and pieces of all the Greek texts were, were summarized and put together as the Textus Receptus for to be the, the work, then that's the basis of our translation. So they take all these various pieces and kind of make one work out of that in Greek in order to translate from. Now, the, new, the modern versions did the same thing, but they did it, they used different manuscripts. Of those, those, those thousands of manuscripts, they used different manuscripts. Right than what the King James is based on. And theirs was translated, the modern versions are translated basically from the work of two men called Westcott and Hort. And they're the ones that compiled their own Greek source. Which, and they still use manuscripts, so don't get me wrong. I mean, they're, they're still using works that were found somewhere, right? They use the, basically, what it, they, they, they put more emphasis on the Egyptian works. Alexandrian. The Alexandrian, exactly. And... Um, <laughs> I mean, just, just as a side note, nothing good ever comes out of Egypt in the Bible. That's true. I mean, that's, if you know your Bible at all, you know that to be true. That, that the Bible is constantly using Egypt as a, a symbol of, of the world and where Satan is and just, just wickedness and everything. But, but not surprisingly, the modern versions use the Egyptian text to drive their work from. And see, there, why do the modern ver versions use a different source text? Well, the philosophy for these translations is basically, and it's not 100%, but it's basically older is better. If you find an older manuscript, it's better because they're going to say it's closer to the original, so whatever is just the oldest one, we're going to probably put the most weight on that. Now, it's an oversimplification. Do the research for yourself if you're really interested in it. and you know, I don't want to make it sound like that's the only thing. But, but that is the... 
an overarching theme in the way that they determine what text to use. If it's older, it's better. But the reason why we can't just rely on that method of thinking is that even Scripture tells us that people have been corrupting God's Word going all the way back to the time of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, the Bible reads, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, we're not like many people that corrupt the Word of God. There were many people of his day that were literally corrupting God's Word. So if they corrupted God's Word and they wrote it down, it could be very old. It could date back to the time of Christ. But does that mean it's more accurate? When we have a report that there are people corrupting God's Word. You know, the Apostle Paul had to sign off with a specific phrase in his epistles so that they knew it was coming from him. Why? Because I believe there was other people trying to mimic the Apostle Paul. I think Satan knew a lot of what was going on at that time and was doing everything he can to, to stop it and to stop the spread of the truth and to get lies mixed in and to cause confusion. So to write a letter as if it's from the Apostle Paul would cause confusion in a church. So the Apostle Paul signed off the same and he would sign, you know, usually what he would do, if you read the epistles, you'll see someone else is, is the vast majority of the time writing, actually doing the writing. Apostle Paul's not doing the writing. He's doing the speaking. Someone else is writing it down for him. And then at the end, he'll sign it with his own hand and he'll sign off his, his, his greeting or his, you know, his, uh, his sign off um, with his words and in his own hand so that they know, yeah, this actually came from Paul. But um, <clears throat> what's interesting about that verse, though, that I just quoted from 2 Corinthians 2.17, I'll read it again. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Right? Every modern translation, excuse me, of the popular ones at least, because I, I didn't look up everyone. All of the popular ones, New American Standard, ESV, even the New King James change this word, this verse, and instead of using corrupt the word of God, they use the word pedal. Now, does the word pedal even mean the same thing as corrupt no. at all? I mean, are, are, they the same, are they synonyms for each other? Is you can sometimes say, oh, well, you just use this word, I use that word. They're completely different. What does pedal mean? It means to sell, right? You're selling something. Corrupting means you're corrupting, you're changing it, you're, you're defiling it, you're making it worse, right? It has nothing to do with the sale of it. But the, the, the new version will say they peddle it. So in the NIV, for example, their, their verse reads, Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. And they had, where did the word for profit come from? That wasn't in... That wasn't in the text. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. So... It's funny how the ones that are corrupting the Word of God don't want you to, to even know that people were corrupting the Word of God back then, but they just think, oh, well, we're just selling it. But then it's like, well, wait a minute. We don't peddle the Word of God for profit, yet what is the NIV doing? They're peddling the Word of God for profit. I mean, that's, that's exactly what they're doing. Wow. They're not even, they're not even true to their own text. 1 Peter uh, 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God's word is incorruptible as defined in first. And again, you know, I'm using definitions and proofs from the Bible because it's God's word and that's what holds the authority. So if you don't like my reasoning, then too bad because it is what it is. But if you're a believer in God's word, we should be able to look at this and say, you know what? God's word is incorruptible. It's defined right here in the text, which means it's not corrupt. I mean, in order for it to be God's word, it has to be incorruptible. It has to be pure. And God's word is what saves us, which is why the Bible is so important. And I'm going to get to that. It's going to be my last point, actually. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to try to get blow through this real quickly. I'm actually doing okay on time, believe it or not. We're going to look at some other major differences between the versions of the Bible. I always like to point this out because if you can say, okay, 
I believe that God's word exists. I believe that God has given us words. He wants us to know about him. I put my faith in Christ. You know, I'm a believer. How do I know, though, that which one's right? Okay, they're based on different texts. They're based on different manuscripts. I get that. But how do I know that the, what the King James used is right and these ones are wrong? Well, there's lots of different ways to look at this. First of all, just knowing the information that they are different and they're definitely different is a big first step. But secondly, you can prove it just by comparing the Bibles. I mean, put them all side by side. Compare them to each other and see which one looks right. And I'll tell you what, I've, and, and I have this in here. I'm getting a little bit at it, but I, I'm going to get to it in a minute. If you can prove that there are contradictions within the Word, then you know it's not from God. And these other versions, and I've done it in the past, and I'm going to show you one example of it here, have contradictions. Like the NIV is full of contradictions. Within the, if, if you just used an NIV, if that's all you did, if you, just, if you just read the book, there are plenty of contradictions within its own text. And you could say, well, that's not of God. Right? You can't do that with the King James. But just to show you, I want to show you some of the differences because people say, oh, well, there's some minor variations, but it doesn't really affect doctrine. It's not that big of a deal. There's some things. Okay, is there anything more of a big deal than like John 3.16? I mean, we're talking about salvation, right? John 3.16, every, you know, most famous verse, and you know what, honestly, most people know this in the King James Version just because it's been so popular for so long. And people have memorized this one verse. Uh, it, you know, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right? His only begotten Son. His only begotten Son. Does anyone know what it means to be begotten? It means He was physically born of, right? Jesus Christ, why is He the only begotten Son of God? The Holy Ghost came upon the Virgin Mary, right? Jesus Christ was the Son of Man and the Son of God. When Jesus Christ was physically born into this world, God was his father. Joseph wasn't. God was his father. But Jesus is the only one that was born that way among men. See, what I don't like about the NIV, I'll read this for you. The NIV reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You say, well, what's the problem with that? I mean, isn't that basically the same thing? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm a son of God. <laughs> the Bible says that we're born again, that, that we become his children. God doesn't have only one son. He's got one begotten son, but he doesn't have only one son. To say it's his one and only son is false right off the bat. It's not his one and only son. The ESV says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Leaving out begotten. Begotten's an important word. It needs to be there. Amen. You say, oh, you're just, you're nitpicking. Uh, you could call it nitpicking. I just believe that every word of God is important. Amen. Another difference in the modern translations uh, and I bring this up, I think, pretty much every time I preach on this subject because it's just so mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing for me when I saw it. Like, how could you leave this out? If you, you want to turn to Acts chapter 2, um, keep your finger in John. I know that's where we start off with, and believe it or not, we are coming back to that. <laughs> We're coming back to John chapter 1. <clears throat> but in Acts chapter 2, you've got the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The Spirit comes upon Philip. He says, hey, you know, go up and join yourself to this chariot. He goes up there. This guy's reading the Bible. He's reading out of Isaiah. And Philip asks him, hey, do you understand what you're reading there? He's like, well, how shall I, you know, how can I accept some man should guide me? He's like, I don't know what I'm reading. Can you tell me what this means? You know, and he, and he looks at the scripture and he's saying, you know, who, who's the prophet speaking of, himself or someone else? And it's, it's like this perfect verse about Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God and his blood being shed. So it's just like this perfect opportunity Philip preaches them the gospel, right? So he preaches them the gospel. They're traveling on their way. Excuse me, I, used to, I said Acts chapter 2. I meant Acts chapter 8. So I apologize for that. I even have Acts chapter 2 written in my notes. I'm like, what in the world? Why do I have that in here? <laughs> it was late when I was putting this together last night. Acts chapter 8. And this is the story. You know, I, I told you the whole story. So they're going on their way. Philip preaches the gospel unto them. 
And the eunuch asks him in verse 36, and as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. So they're going by this water. He says, the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? They say, well, hey, there's water right here. Why can't I be baptized? Right? Philip was just preaching to him. God's so he's like, well, hey, there's some water. Verse 37 says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Makes sense, right? Amen. Hey, here's water. I want to be baptized. Can I be baptized? Well, wait a minute. Do you believe on, you know, you have to believe on Jesus Christ with all your heart. If you do that, yeah, we get baptized. That was his answer. You know what the modern translations do? Verse 37 is gone. So what you have as you read your Bible, or your perversion, excuse me, I don't want to call it a Bible, as you're reading through these modern perversions, you have a eunuch asking a question, hey, look, here's some water. Why can't I be baptized? And then the very next thing that you read, he's being baptized. Why is that important? Oh, I don't know, because this is probably the most clear scripture that we have as to why we don't baptize babies, as to what you know, the, the scriptural uh, obligation is for being baptized. And when you could, you know, you could say, oh, but you could get that from other places. But when you have a text where he asks the very question and then nothing is said about it and he just gets baptized, you can easily argue and say, well, there's nothing required, apparently. Anybody could get baptized because Philip baptized them. He didn't even answer his question. That's pretty rude. Hey, why can't I be baptized? <laughs> All right, come on down here. We'll baptize you. I mean, it, it, it literally is stupidity. But see what's deceiving about the way they do this? And there's actually 16 verses in the NIV that's completely removed. They don't change the numbering. And the way, if you have a King James Version, most King James Versions, not all of them, are laid out where each verse is kind of separated. And you could easily see the number and they all line up. Yes, right? Not everyone is like that, okay, but the majority of them are. Some of them are in paragraph form, but like all of the, mo the, the modern versions are in paragraph form. Which means that the, the, there's no separation between verses. It's all kind of runs together. And then there's some paragraphs where they're, they're a little bit separated. But what they do then with that is as you're reading this story in a perversion, you don't even notice that 37 is missing because you're just kind of reading through and the numbers don't change. The numbers, there's no 37. There's a 37 they'll have a little footnote down there and tell you that, well, in the most reliable manuscripts, this doesn't really exist. And again, just throwing your, your, your confidence out the window, well, is it reliable or not? Should, should I be reading this footnote? Is this the word of God? I don't know. It's down here at the bottom. And sometimes they'll tell you what it says, but it's like removed from the, from the text. A lot of people don't even realize. I've talked to plenty of people out soul winning that just never even seen that before. Didn't even look at the footnote. Didn't even, you know, didn't look at the numbers. Didn't even know. There's many verses like that. 1 John 5, 7, another great example of a change. 1 John 5, 7, of course, is famous for defining the Trinity. Again, core doctrine, I don't know. Baptism, I don't know. Salvation, oh, I don't know. The Trinity, yeah. I, the, you know, they don't mess with core doctrines, right? 1 John chapter 5, Verse 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The three and one, the Trinity, right? The triune God. The modern perversions, the NIV, the New American Standard, and the ESV, verse 7, they all say, for there are three that testify. That's it, end of verse number 7. For there are three that testify. Great, who are they? Where are they? What are they? There's three that testify. Okay, okay. King James says that there are three that bear record in heaven, Amen. the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. But then look at verse number eight. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. So what is it saying? There's three in heaven, there's three in earth. And you know what? The three in heaven are different from the three in earth. Right? I mean, that's what we see here in verses seven and eight. There, verse seven says, for there are three that testify. And then their verse 8 says, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. 
You see what they did there? They chopped off the second half of verse 7 and the first half of verse 8 and merged to do two together into one verse. So the three that testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, right? It's just there's three that testify. And they just become the three that testify on earth. But it's not that important, right? John 3.13 in the NIV, now some of the other versions have this more accurately, but the John 3.13 NIV says, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. No one has ever gone into heaven. That's interesting because I think that the Bible says that Elisha was carried up by a whirlwind into heaven. You remember when he was taken? Yes. Do you remember when Enoch was translated because he walked with God? I'm pretty sure Enoch went to heaven. Because you know, some people tell you, well, Old Testament saints didn't go to heaven. And I've heard that before, and, I, and I'm not going to go into that. But to say that no one has ever gone into heaven, even at the time in, in John chapter 3 when Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, is a lie. It's false. Now, what the, what the Bible says... What God's word says is that, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. That word ascended is important to send it up because that word ascended literally means it's arising up, but it's of your own power. So Jesus Christ ascended up into heaven. Anyone else who's ever gone to heaven has been carried to heaven by the angels. They've all been brought there not by their own power, by any means. We need to be taken there. God needs to take us there. Have, you know, have people be sent to take us there. Jesus Christ ascended up to heaven. He's the only one that's done that. Very important. These are not just little details. Matthew 5.22 in the perversion says, and this is where the contradiction can be found, one of the contradictions. Matthew 5.22 in the King James Bible says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say his brother rake shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So what's it saying? If you're angry with your brother, your brother in Christ, if you get angry with your brother in Christ, and you have no reason to be angry with them, you have no cause to be angry with them, that's a sin. Right? That's not the way you're supposed to be. The NIV, the ESV, and the New American Standard all say, but I say it to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Well, in their own Bible, that makes Jesus a sinner, because you notice what they did was they left off without a cause. It says, I'll read it again, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Just if you're angry with your brother. When Jesus came into the temple in Mark 3, verse 5, even in their perversion, it says, And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched out, and his hand was restored. I, I, I'm sorry, that, that wasn't when he went into the temple. It was when, it was when he was going to heal a man. And there's was like, oh, were you going to heal someone on the Sabbath day? You know? We well, looked around at them with anger. Did he have a cause to be angry with them? Absolutely. Was Jesus sinning? Nope. But if we go by just the text that we see here in these perversions and you remove without a cause, now all of a sudden you make Jesus Christ a sinner. The last place I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just reference for you as a, as a difference is part of our memory verse. Another important one. Remember, we're, we're, we're memorizing the, book of, uh, the chapter 3 of Jonah, Right? Specifically, we're focusing in on the last two verses, which are very important, uh, very important doctrine that we believe in as far as what is required for salvation and what is considered works and what is not considered works. We believe salvation is by grace through faith, of course, not of works, lest any man should boast, as many people will claim. But then a lot of people will throw into that, well, you've got to repent of your sins to be saved. So you've got to give up your sins, you've got to turn over a new leaf, whatever. Well, the problem with that is that the Bible defines 
turning from your wicked ways or turning from your evil ways as being works. That's you working. When you get rid of sin, when you, when you turn away from your sins, you're doing works. Jonah 3.10 in the Bible says, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. Turning from your evil way is works. That's a definition in the Bible. And then it follows it up with, And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So we see God repenting. See, some people think the word repent just means turn from sin. Doesn't mean turn from sin. If God's repenting, God doesn't sin. But you know what the modern versions say? The ESV, the NIV, the New American Standard. Verse 10, when God saw what they did, it doesn't say God saw their works. It just says when God saw what they did how they turn from their evil way. So now all of a sudden you don't get the definition of turning from your evil way being works, just what they did. What they did, they turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them and he did it and he did not do it. It doesn't say he repented, it says he relented. This is kind of mind-blowing because did you know that every Old Testament reference, every reference of God repenting, which is found all in the Old Testament. When you see God repenting in the King James Bible, every single one of them is changed to relented. Now, is relenting the same as repenting? No. No, if someone's relentless, what, they don't ever let up, right? Now, they could be similar in these contexts, but they're not the same. Repenting is a change of mind. It's a change of what you're thinking. It's a turning. You're not going to do I was going to do this. I'm not going to do that anymore. That's a repenting. Relenting means I might still do it, but I'm going to let up a little bit. Big difference. The message to Nineveh was, you know, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Judgment's coming. I'm going to destroy Nineveh. <laughs> When they repented, when they turned from their evil way, though, God changed his mind. He said, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. He didn't relent and say, well, I'm still going to punish you, but it's just not going to be nearly as bad. I'm going you know, I'm I'm to show, you know, show a little bit of mercy. He's, he, he, he changed his mind. He said, okay, I'm not going to do that. Key difference. But again, and, and this should show you the targeted attacks on doctrine, on belief, on the molding and shaping of what you believe because the devil knows that people are going to a book called the Bible to get what they believe. And when you can go through an entire book and never see God repent and then you hear some Baptist preacher say, well, God repents more than anybody else. It's going to sound foreign to you. you. Say, what do you mean God repent? God doesn't repent. God relents. <laughs> but you're not going to see it. You know, it's, it's not even going to throw any any red flags up because seriously think about it if you're being honest with yourself if you're an honest person and you're reading an niv and you, and you you think you got the bible and you've been taught over and over again you need to re you know repentance means turning from your sin because this is taught as fact and it's just completely false but if you're being taught this as so many people are but then you read in your bible god repented i mean it ought to throw up a red flag if you're thinking it all while you read you say but god doesn't sin but see, people use this definition of the word repent, which is false, and now all of a sudden you don't even see God repenting in the Old Testament because you've got these perversions of the Bible. It, it all works together for evil. There is a, a, a evil, an evil force behind what's going on. Now, I could spend all morning going over the extremely critical differences, not only between the King James and these other versions, but also the errors found directly within the modern versions. But I'm not going to do that. We're already getting real late on time. Let me see. I want to prove to you the preservation of God's Word. If we had to rely on mankind and a mere human being to not screw up and to be responsible for maintaining the purity of God's Word, it would be very difficult to put that much confidence in any person or any group of people. To just say that, yes, it's preserved, it's perfect, you know, because these people did it. Even with the scholarship that I mentioned earlier about the King James translators, if I just said, you know what, these guys, they did this great work, but to say that they were, they were inerrant, that they were perfect, that everything that they did was absolutely right, if I just had to trust their study, you know, their scholar, you know, scholarly minds, I'm not going to put my, stake my soul on that the way that I do with the Bible. 
But thankfully, man has not been charged with the task of preserving God's word. I'll read this for you. Psalm 12. If you want to take a note, Psalm 12, verse 6, the Bible reads, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Psalm 12 says that God is going to preserve his words. He's going to preserve them not only for that generation, but forever. God's word is preserved. We can trust it because God is the one doing the preservation. He always uses men. It's just like God's the one who saves your soul. Now, he uses man to go out and preach the gospel. He uses the man to preach his word, but he's the one doing the saving. God is the one that uses man to preserve his word, but he's the one doing the preservation. So a man is used in the process. Yes, of course, we have to. I mean, that's the way things are done here physically in our human world. But God is the one behind it and, and, and making sure that the preservation is being done appropriately and moving and using people for that purpose. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus Christ said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. We're not just losing God's words. We're not just been hidden under a rock somewhere or just corrupted and just died and, and, and disintegrated. His words are not going to pass away. They, they shall not pass away. Matthew 4, verse 3, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God wants us to live by every word of God. How can we do that if we don't have every word of God? God cannot expect us to live by every word. Jesus wouldn't say that if we didn't have every word of God. There's been nothing lost. We can have confidence in the Bible. Proverbs 30, verse 5, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. God treats his word very, very highly. He cares about it a lot. He cares about it so much that the punishment for changing God's words are enormous. In Revelation 22, verse 18, the Bible reads, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, if you add unto the words that God has given you in this book, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Has anyone ever read the plagues of Revelation? Not so nice. He said, I'm going to add unto you these plagues. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. It's a damnable offense to corrupt God's word. That's pretty serious. God says, you have no hope of salvation if you do this. There's only a few things that the Bible mentions that are like that. One of them is blaspheming the Holy Ghost. One of them is taking the mark of the beast. And the other one is corrupting his word, adding and removing from his word. Say, oh yeah, oh, these are God's words? Here, let me, let me, let me change this up a little bit. Oh, Acts 8, 37? Yeah, God didn't say that. You want to know people who are guaranteed to be in hell? Look at the, look at the people involved in the translations on these modern versions that were literally doing the adding and removing from God's word. They're burning in hell if, they're, if, they've, if they've passed already. So why is this all so important? Why do I make such a big deal of it? Why do I have a Bible Sunday? Why, why do we make such a strong stand and say, you know what, we're King James Bible only. With these other versions are of the devil. Why is it so important? Because it's tied in with our salvation. That's why it's so important. We started off in, in John chapter 1. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, so in faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our faith is a result of us hearing the word of God. Not the word of man, not a perversion of God's word, but God's word. You need to be, you need to receive the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God, in order to be saved. No man is ever saved without hearing the word of God. It's impossible. The Word brings forth life. Just as much as we need Jesus Christ for our, as our Savior for our salvation, we need the Word of God because Jesus Christ is 
the Word of God. Amen. John chapter 1, we started off with that explains this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. It is no mistake. It's not just a coincidence. It's not just, oh, well, that's kind of an interesting name. Why does God call Jesus the Word? Every name has meaning, very important meaning. It's not just, oh, well, just God just felt like calling him the Word. For no reason, just whatever. No, it's very important because Jesus Christ encapsulates the Word of God bodily. The Word, the Word of God is living. It's life. It provides life. Yeah, we call this the Word of God, but the book and the pages and the binding and you know the, the paper, that's not the Word of God. The, wor the Word is the words here. And, and Jesus Christ, these words... Jesus embodied these words, right. is these words. Amen. John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh. Or God's Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven. We went over this already. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There's another reference to the Word. Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Remember that. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Again, another reference to Jesus Christ. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Our King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, our Savior, is called the Word of God. Many times throughout the Bible, we just saw a few of them right there. Jesus Christ is the Word of God, and just as much as it says that He was called faithful and true, Revelation 22, 6 says, And He said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. Jesus Christ, the embodiment, is called faithful and true. God's words or his sayings are called faithful and true also. You can't separate the two. You cannot separate Jesus Christ from the word of God. If you have a different word of God, you have a different Jesus. You have a different Savior. It's not the same Word of God. The Bible says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus doesn't change. God's Word doesn't change. I was wondering what fell down. It's my last pages of notes. That's why I can't find my last reference. It's one reference I've left. He doesn't change. That's why we use an old Bible. It doesn't change. We don't need to make corrections and additions and removals. Same as it has been. Same as it was. Same as it's always been. It's the Word of God. It's incorruptible. We recognize that the Bible is not the words of men. This is what our faith is in. It's the word of God. Second Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Just as much as I'm going to stand up and, and preach my Savior Jesus Christ, I'm going to stand up and, and preach the Word of God. This is, I mean, this is our foundation. Jesus Christ is our foundation. The Word of God is our foundation. They're inseparable. We need the right Word of God. We need to get this, we need to, to share this information with other people. If you don't have any resources, we got plenty back there, but also remember to share this with other people, especially out here. We run into quite a few people that are saved already. 
And praise God for that, that people are saved. You know, we're getting people saved, but there's a lot of people already saved. Try to remember to bring up this important topic because in order for people to grow in the Lord, they need God's Word. Right. They, they need to be getting into this Word. So bring the resources with you. Hand them out. Tell people about it. And um, I, this is a very critical point in our belief. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, we thank you for preserving them for us. We thank you that we can trust, as much as we can trust you, as much as we can trust Jesus Christ for our sa for, as our Savior to, to pay, that paid for all of our sins, dear Lord, as much trust as we can have in that, dear God, I thank you that we can have just as much trust in your words, that, that they are here for us today, that you promised to preserve them from this generation forever, dear Lord, and that we have access to them. I pray that you please help us to um, spread your words unto others, dear Lord, and I pray that you please just, just bless our church with many, many more years to come of doing your service and your work and standing up for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.